Hi everyone, good morning and welcome back to the Sunday service of ICF Portimao Alga. I'm so glad that you all are um, worshipping and as well as listening to the word of God today together. Even though maybe we are not meet up uh, face to face, but we know that what the spirit that here with me and also the spirit is there. The spirit of God always wherever we are. Okay, today first um, I would like to share about Psalm 25:5, which is said that lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. As we know that only God that we wait for the day long. While in the night in the version of New International Version, it was said that, Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. This verse remind me again that only God that we, our hope, only God that we always uh, looking for and long for each day. Even though at the moment, the world doesn't promise things, and seems like everything chaos. Everything was not according to what we planned, and a lot of uh, voices, a lot of things, noisy things. Like okay, today I'm here, and maybe you can hear a lot of noisy things around me. However, if we focus on God, if we ask his guidance if we ask that he lead us through all our day even through all our problem our process of life i'm sure he will hold us he will teach us he will also show us the way as long as we are humble enough to be teachable to be a mold, to be guided to be lead and also to be disciplined so we have to open up with everything I know it's a lot of things that God has processed me um, through my life. Even when I moved to Portugal, it's a lot of things that I've experienced that I never experienced before. That God bring me from my comfort zone to where I don't know who to depend on. But God teach me not to depend on others, not to depend on the human, but instead depend on Him. Because He the one who bring me, He will guide me, He will lead me, and He will show me what is His purpose that He bring, he bring me here. Okay, let's, we prepare again for our Sunday service. I'm sure that Holy Spirit will lead our uh, heart to listen. To the guidance of God. Let's be praying. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for today first of all that remind us that you only you a lot that we hope only you that will guide us, lead us and only you that we long for each day that we always a lot depend on you not to the others. Even uh, there is things that is not promising but we know there is a hope that in, in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, uh, we would like to um, we would like to worship together. We would like to pray together, and even we would like to listen to the word of God that is always uh, make us uh, make us realize and even to discipline us, to remind us, even to give um, a fresh water in our heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We would like to put all this. Um, Sunday service into your hand in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday everyone. God bless you.
Would you mind passing me my orange juice? Thank you. Would you mind grabbing my toast? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning everyone, it's good to be with you again. And in our prayers today we remember all those in our church family for whom we have been praying. We remember Connie's husband Reinhold, whose chemotherapy has gone well. There's Macaulay, Sue's grandson, who had a cardiac arrest and was resuscitated, but the cause of the collapse has never been diagnosed. Macaulay is leading a normal life and gauges his improvement on the way that he can run around while playing football. John Tipping is coping with his chemotherapy and doing well, as is Jenny's friend, Pat. We continue to pray for Debbie's mum, who has undergone surgery. And we thank you, dear Lord, for listening to our prayers and being beside these people. And today, as we continue to keep them in our prayers, we ask you to bless Stephen, whose mother Joan passed away last week in Portimao. 
So wherever we are, and in whatever country, shall we all pray together as we give thanks to our Most Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, as we celebrate this service today, we thank you that we are able to worship you as one family and know that wherever we are, you are there by our side. We see each day all the wonderful things you have created. Please help us to look after your world and all the living creatures in it. Thank you for the provisions you have made in our lives and give us eyes to see how we can share them with others. We hear of more people without safe homes in which to live. We hear of other Christians who are persecuted and sometimes threatened with death for their belief. We think of those struggling to feed their families. And as always, we thank all those who help to feed the hungry at our soup kitchen in Portimao. Last Sunday, they served around 250 meals and some days it can be more. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that this is possible. And please bless all those who volunteer to help with either being there, preparing food, and as in this coming as is, and as in this coming week, standing at the supermarket entrances and greeting shoppers with a smile, whilst offering them a bag to bring back a few purchases. Sadly, we still see daily the horrors of the war in Ukraine and in Israel and Palestine. We think of all the bereaved families for families who don't know if their loved ones are alive or dead, and for those held hostage, and for the tragedy of all those premature babies, many of whom died because electricity supplies had been cut off and their life support machines were unusable. And these are the wars that reach our television screens each day. We also pray for the wars and unrest in other parts of the world. The horrors for them are the same. And as a little boy in primary school the other day asked, why do grown-ups have to fight wars? Please, Lord, help to answer that question. And as we end our prayer time this morning, dear Lord, we thank you that we can be part of your family. May we be ready this week and beyond to share this joy with others. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength and Christ thy right.
Good morning, everyone. Today's reading is from Luke 9, 18, 9 through 14. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Thank you for letting me share, and have a good Sunday. Bye-bye. joys and for the sorrows, the best and worst of times, for this moment, for tomorrow, for all that lies behind. Fears the crowd around me, for the failure of my plans, for the dreams of all Oh uh-huh.
Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us for our worship today from the International Christian Fellowship in Portimao. Let's go to the Lord in a moment of prayer as we open his word together. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for each person who's gathered with us today. And Lord, I just pray that you would speak to us through your word. You have something here for each of us today, Lord. So I just pray that you'd speak quietly into our hearts as we hear this passage today. In your precious name we ask. Amen. I'm sure most of you have heard of the novel by Charles Dickens called A Tale of Two Cities. My message today has a similar title because it's called A Tale of Two Sinners. Two men went to the temple to pray. The main difference between them was that one knew he was a sinner and the other didn't. Luke begins by telling us the original audience for this parable. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. He almost certainly had the Pharisees in mind as he spoke, and yet the story has a timeless message for all the followers of Jesus, both then and now. In the ancient world, prayers were generally said out loud, even when they were personal prayers. Standing was one of several, several acceptable postures for prayer and was commonly used. Devout Jews prayed three times a day at nine, twelve and three o'clock. And it was believed that prayer was particularly effective if it was said at the temple, that magnificent building in the very heart of Jerusalem. And so Luke presents to us two characters who go up there to pray. These men are poles apart in every possible way. One is a Pharisee, the other is a tax collector. The Pharisee was a highly respected person, an esteemed religious leader and a member of the social elite. The tax collector, on the other hand, was not a religious man at all. He was generally considered a thief for collecting more money than he should, and he was despised as being a traitor to his own people since he worked for the Romans. And although both men were Jewish and both went to the same place of worship on this particular day, they had little else in common. So let's take a look at these two characters. First of all, the Pharisee. Now, he doesn't really go to the temple to pray. He goes to prove that he is a devout man. He believes that righteousness consists in doing good works and keeping the law. So he goes to recite his good deeds before God and the people. As a religious leader in the community, he believes it's important for him to be seen and heard at the temple at the designated hours of prayer. It's part of his religious tradition, which he observes faithfully. So as he opens his mouth, he reminds God and all those listening how he has been most diligent to obey the law. He gives himself a glowing testimonial. He begins with the form of a prayer. God, I thank you. Well, some of the Psalms start in this way but they always thank God for something that he has done, such as Psalm 9, verse 1. I praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. Or Psalm 30, verse 1. I exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. Or Psalm 116, verse 1. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Instead of proclaiming how great God is, the Pharisee proudly tells him and everyone listening how good he is. Instead of being thankful for what God has done, the Pharisee is thankful for what he has done himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. Our English text uses the word I five times in the space of just a few lines. This man's so-called prayer is all about himself. 
There's no room for the Lord. In his monologue, the Pharisee reminds God and his human audience of the dreadful vices he stayed away from, theft, evil, and adultery. In other words, he's kept the commandments, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. He's been faithful to keep the law as handed down by Moses. Above all, he's thankful that he's not like the tax collector, someone he regards as the scum of the earth, a man well known for stealing people's money and giving it to the Romans, and then pocketing a little extra for himself. He would never do a thing like that. But this Pharisee has done more than just keep the law perfectly. He has fasted and tithed too. The Jews only had one required fast per year, and that was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But they chose to observe four additional fasts throughout the year as well. The most pious Jews also fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. Thursdays, the fifth day, because they believed that was the day that Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. And Mondays, the second day, because that was the day that he came back down. So instead of the one required fast day, the Pharisees observed 109 of them. Since Mondays and Thursdays also happened to be market days in Jerusalem, the Pharisees took great pleasure in painting their faces white and wearing disheveled clothes so that they would be seen and admired by the crowds who would come in from the country to buy and sell local produce. In Matthew 23:27, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for being whitewashed tombs which looked beautiful on the outside but inside are full of dead men's bones. And this image of their whitewashed faces was probably what Jesus had in mind as he spoke. The Pharisees went above and beyond the requirements of the law, not only in the matter of fasting, but also in tithing as well. The law stated that they should give a tenth of their flocks, herds, grain and fruit to the Lord. The Jews added vegetables to the list, but the Pharisees went one step further and even tithed their garden herbs as well. For every nine leaves of dill or mint that they used, they set aside one for the Levites, and the same with the tiny cumin seeds. In Matthew 23, Jesus told them that it was good that they gave produce from their gardens, but that they should also give more important things, such as justice and mercy. Although they were sticklers for minute details, they often lost sight of the big picture and what was most important. The Pharisees were very proud of their accomplishments. One ancient rabbi, Rabbi Simeon, son of Jokai, said, If there were only twenty sorry, if there were only thirty righteous people in the world, my son and I would make two of them. If there were but twenty, my son and I would be of that number. If there were but ten, my son and I would be in the number. And if there were but five, my son and I would be of the five. If there were but two, my son and I would be those two. And if there were but one, I myself would be that one. Well, the Pharisee in our story has a similar confidence in his self-righteousness, and he proudly reports all that he has been faithful to do. Those standing nearby are duly impressed. But God isn't, because sadly, the Pharisee didn't go to the temple to give praise to God. He went to receive praise for himself. Meanwhile, another man is also at the temple praying, some distance away from the Pharisee, yet close enough to be observed by him. And this man is the tax collector. Now he deliberately chooses to stay away from the crowd. He has come to talk to God alone 
And he's not thinking about the other people. He knows they hate him anyway. His heart is heavy. He realizes that he has cheated people on their taxes. He knows that everyone despises him, and with good reason too. He has betrayed his own people and gone to work for their enemy, the Romans. He feels terrible about his life. He has given up the faith of his fathers for greedy gain. No one likes him. Even his own family have rejected him. Knowing that he has no good works or righteousness of his own, he cries out to God begging for his forgiveness. He's so ashamed of what he has done that he doesn't even look up to heaven as he prays, but beats his breast repeatedly as a sign of great remorse and cries out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's no pretense here, no facade of good works to cover up a sinful heart. The tax collector sees himself in the same way that God does, a sinner in need of his help and mercy, and God is more than happy to grant his request and forgive him. As David wrote in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Now it's interesting that in the Greek, the tax collector calls himself not just a sinner, but the sinner. He knows he's done wrong, and so does everyone else in his community. He's well known for his sins, a bit like the town drunk. We don't see him looking around to compare himself with someone worse in order to make him feel better. He readily accepts his guilt and confesses his wrongdoing before God. He reminds me of the Apostle Paul who was so conscious of his failures that in 1 Timothy 1.15 he referred to himself as the foremost of sinners or we might translate that today, the most infamous of sinners. That's how the tax collector feels, an acute sense of shame and remorse at what he has done that has hurt so many people. And yet, that is just the kind of person that God can forgive, the one who comes to him, admits his sin, and humbly asks for forgiveness. And so the story is a tale of two sinners, one who realizes that he's a sinner and one who doesn't. The Pharisee is confident of his own righteousness, which he believes is obtained through good works and obeying the law. In his mind, he has no sin to confess, but he's oblivious to his pride and arrogance, which blind him to his need for God and his forgiveness. He doesn't realize that that very pride is a sin against God. And that pride makes him look down at everyone else as being inferior to him. On the other hand, the tax collector knows that he has no righteousness to boast of. He knows he sinned and he admits it, pleading for God's mercy. That is the attitude that's pleasing and acceptable to God. Jesus says that out of the two men, it was the tax collector who went home justified or considered righteous before God. It wasn't that he hadn't done anything wrong. Yes, he had done wrong, and Jesus doesn't deny that. But he relied on God to forgive his sins, whereas the Pharisee thought he had none to forgive. One man returned home exactly as he had come, proud and puffed up about all the good things that he had done. The other returned home a changed man with a heart full of joy that he had been forgiven and had received a new start in life. One man went to the temple as a sinful man in his own eyes and came home righteous in the eyes of God. The other went to the temple as a righteous man in his own eyes, but came home still a sinner 
in the eyes of God. In some ways, this parable is a little bit like the story of the prodigal son and the elder brother. The repentant tax collector is like the prodigal son who knew he'd done wrong and was sorry for his sins. The Pharisee is like the elder brother who, in his own eyes, had done nothing wrong and didn't rejoice when the lost person was found. How wonderful it is that our Lord is not like the stu stern, rule-bound God of the Pharisees, but he's the gracious father of the prodigal son. Well, this is a story brimful of contrasts. The respected versus the despised, the proud versus the humble, the self-righteous versus the spiritually bankrupt. But there are two other contrasts that I would also like to mention. First of all, the contrast between ritual and relationship. The Pharisee was a very religious man, but his religion was all about the things that he did and didn't do. It was all about himself. On the outside, he looked good. He had a perfect track record of keeping the commandments, giving and tithing. But his heart wasn't in it. He was cold towards God and he was cold towards other people. He had the form of religion, but inside there was nothing there. And it reminds me of a loaf of bread that I once saw. Uh, when Josh and Faith were young, about five and three, our whole family went to stay one Christmas with my mum and dad in England. And one day the children were playing in the kitchen, running in and out of the door, uh, laughing and giggling and having a wonderful time. Well, we had no idea what was going on until it came time for tea. Uh, my mum always used to buy a, a big loaf of white, fresh, crusty bread in the morning. And then in the afternoon at tea time, she would slice it and butter it and we'd eat it with jam uh, with our tea. Well, on this particular day, when she took out the bread and tried to slice it, the whole thing caved in. And little known to the rest of us, Josh and Faith had eaten all of the inside of the bread. They just took a real liking to my mum's fresh bread and had scooped out all of the inside, leaving the hard, crusty shell intact. And that's all that was left, just an empty shell. And that reminds me of the religion of the Pharisees. They had the form of religion, but there was no heart to it. It looked good on the outside, but inside it was just hollow and empty, like the loaf of bread. On the other hand, the tax collector poured out his heart to God. He confessed his sin and pleaded for God's mercy, which he received. The tax collector wasn't a religious man. He had none of the external trappings of religion that the Pharisee boasted in. But through repentance and faith, he entered into a real saving relationship with God. And that was what mattered. And this story serves as a warning to us to make sure that we don't let ritual take the place of a relationship with God. It's not enough just to come to church and sing the hymns and say the prayers. God wants us to invite him into our hearts as well. He wants a loving relationship with each one of us. Then the second contrast I'd like us to consider is the one between criticism and kindness. As the Pharisee looked across at the tax collector in great distress, it never occurred to him as a religious leader to ask him what was wrong and see if there was anything he could do to help. Instead, he gloated in his own respectability and was glad that he wasn't like him. He saw the tax collector as a traitor, a thief and a cheat, and so he despised him and considered himself to be so much better. He had no idea of the wonderful change that God was working in the tax collector's heart. The Pharisee was critical, whereas God was kind. God saw the heartfelt repentance in the tax collector. He heard his cry for mercy and was glad to extend it to him 
and offer forgiveness. Like the Pharisee, we too can be very poor judges of character. Sometimes we can be critical instead of being kind. You know, one of the people we help at the soup kitchen is a, a guy called Stefan. He's totally homeless, so he has a bit of a hard outer shell which he's developed to survive. Sometimes he drinks, and when he does, he can be a bit difficult to deal with. At times, some of our volunteers have been quite scared of him and have said they thought we shouldn't serve him. Uh, but I knew that wasn't the way. Underneath the hard exterior, though, is a really nice person who just needs a little extra love and kindness. Last Sunday, one of our helpers, Vanessa, took him a warm winter coat. She explained how her son really wanted him to have it. And big tears started rolling down Stefan's face. He just couldn't believe it. And then she pulled out a tent that she'd brought for him. Well, as you can imagine, he was totally overwhelmed and he couldn't believe that there were people who cared about him that much. And as I thought back and remembered the volunteers who'd been so afraid of Stefan and uh, thought that he was such a terrible person, I wished that they could have seen him at that moment and seen the other side of his personality. You know, so often we condemn others by what we see with our eyes or hear with our ears, whereas God looks at people's hearts because that's the part that really matters. And so only he is in a, person, in a position to judge and not us. Our job is not to be critical, but to be kind. Because we never know what God is doing in someone else's heart. Look what he did in the heart of the despised tax collector. Through this parable, we can see that we too have a choice in our approach to God and in our attitude towards other people. We can come to God as part of a ritual and be proud of our good deeds, or we can enter into a loving relationship with him and thank God for his mercy to us. We can treat others with criticism and think that we are better than them, or we can treat them with kindness as God has treated us. And when we make the right choice, God blesses us. And the saying of Jesus is shown to be true, that everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful story which teaches us so much. It's packed full of meaning and significance, and it has so many lessons for us in our lives. Lord, as we consider this story, help us to remember that our relationship with you is what really matters. Keep us, Lord, from letting our faith become a, just a ritual where we go through the motions of going to church, of singing the hymns and saying the prayers, and that it's all just a form of religion with no heart. Oh, Lord, help us to always remember that what matters is our relationship with you and to focus on that. And Lord, in our attitudes towards others, help us, Lord, to always treat others with kindness and not with criticism. Lord, we never know what you are doing in other people's hearts. So let us not judge them, but be kind to them. And when possible, show them the love that you have shown to us. In your precious name we pray. Amen.
get to this Knowing you, Jesus Knowing you There is no greater thing You're my own, you're the best You're my joy, my righteousness Join.